<laughs> okay. Uh, just before we go here, does anybody want to take a short time and, and just put a few things out that you like about Christmas and this time? And I'll just give you that opportunity if we got a microphone to hand around. What's that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so if you have anything, just, you know, don't have to make a long thing out of it, just a short thing, just to say what do you like about this season. Don't. Hey, praise the Lord. <laughs> that is an amen. <laughs> you get presents. Oh, praise God. That's a good thing. <laughs> praise the Lord. Wrapping presents. Wow. And receiving them. And giving them. For me, so far this month, I've probably gone to eight or nine Christmas parties. Ooh. And I got two more to go before Christmas Day. And I'm just thankful for the blessings that um, God has given me opportunities to meet new people, see the people I have not seen in some but two years, like many years. And I just wanted to say thank you, Lord, for the blessings that I'm able to see people I haven't seen in a while. And I'm praying that this year I will be with family. And so. Praise the Lord. That's what I'm looking forward to. Good. Anybody else? Al's up here. As you get older, I just think it's just an awesome time to reflect and think about when you were young, when you were when you were a child, and and the perception of what Christmas and the the excitement that came with the Christmas morning, and mm -hmm. the traditions that that take place of going to church on Christmas Eve, and and uh, the things that uh, have passed away, but. <laughs> We can reflect on on those times that sometimes it just brings peace and joy to to your heart. Praise the Lord. When Sharon was here and she, she we sang that Mary, did you know? And something just settled in my heart when she mentioned about our children, and you know. Some of us, almost, probably most of us, have people in our family or friends who do not know Jesus. Um, and f so just for years and years, I've been uh, uh, believing for the people in our family um, that God is going to be a part of their life, that Jesus is going to be there. And it just, I don't know, it's settled in my spirit to think about my children and my children's children and, you know, our family, that, Elaine, did you know that your baby boy, oh, or whoever, all of those things are already in them. They're mm -hmm. already in them. And mm -hmm. we declare and we believe. And so that has just been on my heart this Christmas about believing for my family and yep. Elaine did you know that your baby boy your baby girl your mom your dad or whatever has this in them and you're believing for them so praise the Lord uh, thank you God and uh, help us count our blessings one by one, and the church seems to be a real blessing. And uh, and uh, thank you, God, for sending your son to be a way maker. So Jesus says, yeah. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by me. And uh, Apostle was saying, uh, you know, I was talking about uh, soul winning. And uh, he says that uh, people in our part of the world need to see signs and wonders so mm -hmm. people were talking about that signs and wonders so mm -hmm. they can come to christ and then uh always like the verse uh um first corinthians fifteen fifty eight 
Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That's right. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Awesome. Now, yep, he said it. Sorry. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure I got you. I was, I was thinking there. My brain's running a little slow, slow again today. <laughs> it's not going to act up like it did last week, though. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Anybody else? Going once, twice, three times? Praise the Lord. Thank you. I just want to give a little time out to give praise to the Lord because it's so awesome when we do that. We're designed to praise Him in all things. And I start thinking, and I usually do things differently on, Sun, on Christmas than most people. Most, of course, I do different on most of everything. But anyway, this <laughs> it's always been... <laughs> Pretty much that way. <laughs> but I got thinking about this season, and it's all about love. This season is all about love. I know there's not too much love out there when people are trying to break you know, each other up or run over people trying to get the gift that's left or whatever else is going on in the store. There's not much love that way. But there needs to be more love, and they wouldn't have that. I'm going to John 3.16. Anybody knows John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God did not send his Son into this world to condemn it, but to save it. In 18, there is no judgment awaiting those who trust him. But those who do not trust him already have been judged for not believing in the only Son of God. Their judgment is based on this fact. The light from heaven came into the world, but they loved their darkness more than the light, so their actions were evil. They hated the light because they went, or they went to sin in the darkness. They stayed away from the light for fear their sins will be exposed and they will be punished. Anybody here, when you sin, do you do that in open? Maybe, uh, well, I know this isn't right, but I'm going to do it anyway, and you still do it, and but you aren't letting everybody know what's happening on. And that's still true. We're still, we're some, we might even be living in darkness a little bit ourselves, even though we have light dis in us. Something to think about. I said, when I was reading that, I'm thinking, wow, this is interesting. Kind of judge, I had to judge myself a little bit on what was happening. But those who do what is right come to the light gladly so everyone can see what they are doing what God wants. Powerful. People either run to the light or run away from the light. You are the light, so you shine upon those people when you get around the darkness. Think about what happens. That's why a lot of them hide from you, because they don't want you to know what's happening, or they don't want you to see what's going on, or they don't want to go and deal with the issues. I was thinking, God so loved the world that he gave his only son God so loved the world. See, sometimes we put us, people, in the place of what God did. He loved the world. Did you realize that he loves mosquitoes? Anybody here loves mosquitoes? <laughs> Anybody here likes jiggers? Anybody loves ants? Well, that comes under the heading of uh, pestilence. Pestilence? <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's because of Ben's sin, but he still loves them. <laughs> it was after the sin; they're still out there causing problems, right? But he, but he said he loved the world. He didn't just love us people. You know, he loves all those things that sometimes bug you. Think about that. So the reality is, he, he loves the trees. He loves the grass. He loves everything. So we don't always con have the concept of what's going on when we look at what Jesus, why he sent his son. He's restore everything. And I always go back to Isaiah 9, 6, which probably should pretty well remember if you've been around here too long, or been around for a while. I should change my wording there, sorry. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and a government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor and Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the interest is of government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David 
and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from here forth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. In other words, he brought back. God knew that there was going, he was going to save the earth. He wasn't coming down to condemn it. So he sent a son which took the authority over in this earth. This is what he did way back when. But he loved the earth enough to do that. You know, Jesus had to love us enough to be able to leave his beautiful plush throne living in heaven. How many people that would live in heaven would want to come down and, and do what he did for us, for, for your neighbor beside you or the next person? And there's not too many from us, from our viewpoint, would we do that? Well, sometimes there is. I don't know why it came up, but it came up. There's a song out there that sings, you know, if I could take the nails from your, your hands. What happens is I used to sing that song at first, but there's just something that rubbed me wrong. Because the people didn't understand. There, if you took the nails from Jesus' hand, nobody would be saved. Because they're looking at it from a compassionate side. They're not looking at it from the understanding of spiritual and what needed to be done. Oh, I feel this way, and I feel that way. And that's sometimes how we walk around. We feel this, and we feel that. But it has nothing to really do with what we need to know that what's going on. Because you can undo things that, that aren't supposed to be undone. I heard here a while back, I was listening to some stuff and reading all kinds of different things that the Lord's got me reading right now. And I ran across this saying, even if you bless something that is evil, it will always be blessed. I thought about that. I said, oh, wow. You know, Jesus said to the disciples when he breathed on them before he left the last time, he says, if you forgive sins, he says, you have the right to remit their sins. If the sins are remitted, they're remitted. If they're, if they're not, then they're kept. And I got to thinking about this. It's been really praying. It's just something for you to pray about. It said, don't bless something that you aren't supposed to bless. Ask God. Ask the Lord, are you supposed to bless these things? Or you might be blessing something that's evil. And if you bless them and you have the legal right to bless them, guess what? You're going to be blessed. They're going to be blessed. You're thinking about it from a kingdom understanding. I don't know why I got on that subject, but I just felt it came up. The fact is, if you're a king, and what does the king does? His words are law. So your word, when you say, bless this, and then they're doing evil, guess what? They're going to keep doing a lot of things they shouldn't be doing because they've been blessed. I said, wow. I mean, there's just a lot of things that the Lord wants to impart into us. A more maturity in the Lord and, and in this season. So ask God before you go blessing people. And if you should be blessing, you should be maybe saying something else instead of blessing. I know we have some people that we've been around and we've had some disagreements, nothing serious, but I made a decision not to, uh, not to come against them because you don't want to come against them because they're victims of the devil. So I understand that. So when I hear something, I see something, and I'm thinking, okay, and I see that same issue going on that, I knew it was a problem. I just say, Lord, bless them. But the Lord's just showing me now, did I want you to bless them? Maybe there's something else that I need to say over them that will change the situation so they won't be doing what they're doing. So we need to take some time and really ask the Lord what he wants and on how he wants to do it. And with Karen, what she was saying, I agree with her 100%. I was ready to do something. And she was just sitting there praising and worshiping the Lord and saying how much she loved God. That's all she did. And God took care of everything. And the reason being, we want to jump up and do something. We want to take over. It's like the man that came to church one night. You know, I've talked about it before, and Sharon also said it on Friday. He always dropped his wife off, went home, spit, whittled, and cussed, they said. He came back, picked her up, and the lights were on, and the music wasn't playing, and Nobody was walking around, and he thought he'd left. He got there too late. So he walked inside, and they were all sitting in the, in the pews doing nothing, just sitting. 
lights on, doors open. So he sat down in the back pew, and he sat there for a little bit, and pretty soon he started shaking. He got up, and he walked all the way down to the front, got down to the altar. You know, the first thing you do, man, that pastor would be down there talking to him immediately to get him taken care of. The pastor said this, Lord, you started it. Lord, you finish it. He got healed, saved, and delivered right there in the front. Why? Because the Holy Ghost was doing it. Sometimes we step and interfere and stop the Holy Ghost from doing what the Holy Ghost wants to do. I almost did that, but I didn't. It was that the Lord knew what he was doing, and he took care of things. It was an interesting situation. We just love how God works when we let him work. Sometimes we don't let him work. We get in the way all the time. But that's why he gave us a government, a way to, to be over and in charge. So we need to go and, and really work and watch what we're doing with the authority that he's given us. I went to Romans 8, 18 through 21. If somebody want to read that. Romans 8, 18 through 21. Should be up there. Yet, yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. And it, no, 21? Yeah. And that's got to be more than that. Well, I'm sure. That, <laughs> well, yeah, there was more. <laughs> you want me to <laughs> For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also s who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that it is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Yep. Likewise, the Spirit who also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which, not, which cannot be uttered. Now, he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Mm -hmm. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Mm -hmm. More? Yeah, that's fine. Think about this. I'm trying to put a little pattern out here. The fact is God's loved the world. What is the world wanting to do and have done? He's waiting for us. The world is waiting for us. What, how and why is God, or why is the world waiting for us? Because, see, he said he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now, he loved the world. He sent his son. His son came down and set up a government. The government was to do what? to give us authority and power. We were to grow and change. So in, in Romans 8, and I don't know what I messed up here. I, I guess I went from 10 to 20 instead of 18 to 21, but that's what I was looking at. But down here on, you know, on, on 21, that the creation itself will be liberally, liberate, you know, from the bondage to, to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. Now, what kind of freedom of the children of God can that happen? Think about that. What kind of freedom of the children of God? How is God going to set the children of God free to begin with? See, we're looking at something here that happened on, and when we're celebrating this time, we need to realize what really is behind it. Why is it so important? Well, we got saved. Yeah, I agree, we get saved. That's important, very important. 
But the reality comes down to there's deeper things than that. Just think about it. God wanted the earth. He loved the earth so much he sent his son. His son came and he set up a government. And that government gives what? His children the ability to change situations. Change situations. Change situations. By changing that situation, one of them that maybe we never thought about before, for the creation was subject to uh, frustrations, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one that is subjected, and hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage. What bondage is the creation under right now? Hmm? Death and decay. Where does death and decay come from? Sin. Sin brings death and decay. Sin comes in and makes an attitude of people who have bad things about the land. If you go back into the curse, Matthew or uh, Deuteronomy 28, and I don't know which curse, which one it is. In the, it's after 15, and it says that uh, it talks about that you will have. Uh, inflammation. That's a curse. Inflammation. Is, did you know inflammation was a curse? And what's the biggest problem with diseases today? Inflammation. You look through this study of you know medicine and everything else that does the study. Inflammation causes most diseases. You get when most of the drugs they go after is to get rid of the inflammation. And trying to get rid of the curse that we live under. That'll give you some revelation to think about. But think about that as you start to think about the curse that's going on. And what happens is if inflammation is that, how did we get inflammation? Because man has been so greedy and has taken so much from the land that it is causing the crops to be dead. Which is causing our body not to get what it needs. That's physical. So when you look at that, what's happening? That's where, this is what it's talking about right here. This is what Jesus said. He loves the world so much, he wants to set the world free. He wants to make it beautiful. He wants to make it look great. And I've said it before, if you go down to, uh, where was it? Uh, it's down south in southern uh, South America. There was a, a country down in there that, that started to grow. Andy Kond, uh, or, or whatever his name was, was down there, a big revivalist. And he started doing some things. And they've actually had pictures and videos of the crops. When the revival hit the ground or that land, immediately carrots this long. And, and they were thick, big, thick carrots. And the same thing with the, the fruits were starting to get bigger. Why? The land was blessed. God can replenish the land. God can replenish our fruit. God can do all these things. And see, that's what it's all about. He wants to bless. He loves the world so much. Not just people. The whole thing. And sometimes we don't always look at that. I don't know why the Lord wants to bring this out, but there's something there that he wants us to know. And that's why he set up the kingdom. So the kingdom can then rule over the land. So when you start to rule over the land, you're not just ruling over people. You're not just getting a few people saved. You're not getting a few people healed. You're taking authority that God had given us over the whole land, over the world. That's what he's saying. He, the, the earth was given to man. We were to watch over, take care of him, and, and see what's going on that way. But see, that's one of the things that as I was studying, I was just saying, boy, that's quite something. we got to... Go that way. Then I really heard some other things that were interesting and some other stuff that the Lord was showing me and having me read and listen to. And uh, I got to see, and I've talked about the covenants. I've talked about what has happened in the systems that I said. I'm not going back through that, but <coughs> the, I came up with the love of God has changed God's covenant he had given prior to of the old covenant. It was the love of God that changed that covenant. There's a spiritual key within that if you understand. If you start praying and seeking the Lord, he'll give you revelation on that. 
The love of God had changed God's covenant, the old covenant, to the new covenant. He changed from the old covenant to the new covenant. You might say, how did that go? Well, the scripture's right here. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Well, what did that happen? Love sent his son, which caused the New Testament. <coughs> when that happened, became a very important part of that was faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love then entered into people's lives, into their hearts. In a new way. By the love of God. And I heard one person talking about this. And I'm just going to put this out and you can pray about it and see exactly what the Lord would show you. But the greatest weapon is the Father's love. The greatest weapon. I've heard great weapons this way and great weapons that way. The greatest weapon is the Father's love. Are you using it? Are you walking in it? Do you have it? Do you want more of it? Are you seeking it? <clears throat> if it's that important, why well, this is what we need to be dealing with. It went on to say, as long as you walk in the Father's love, you will never fail. Whew. I mean, truly walk in the Father's love. You will never fail. You'll know who you are. You'll know what you can do. You know that you have authority and power, and you start to do things, and you'll be amazed what will happen because you're walking in the love. Why? Because in that last commandment, it says, love the Lord thy God with all, his, all your soul, your heart. You know, that one. And then love the neighbor as yourself. When you're saying love your neighbor as yourself, if you do not love yourself, you cannot effectively do what you need to help other people. I'm sorry. Until the body of Christ gets to the point where they learn how to love themselves and walk in love in the way God wants them to walk in, we're, we're defeated. I'm sorry, that's just honest truth right there. That's why God did. He loved us so much. He sent his own, only son. He loved the world way past us, everything. And he gave us authority to watch over them. That's why Chris can turn around and tell the mosquitoes to leave, and they leave. He still loves the mosquitoes. I mean, Chris might not, but the, God loves the mosquitoes. But he loved Chris enough to give him the authority to tell him to get out of there. See, we've got to get the pattern going the right way. We've got to see the right understanding on how to go. It's the same thing with Karen and her rabbits. She, you know, God still loves the rabbits. And her rabbits love her garden. But Karen doesn't like her rabbits in the garden. So she says, I've got enough authority by God's name that you can't be here. And they, they go. He gave us authority to watch over things. And we get that full understanding. This might seem like it's a woo 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 but it's not. It's truth. It's just getting to know the truth and setting people free. This is why God sent that down this way. Praise the Lord. I also heard the fruit of the tree of life is God's love. And you must be your daily bread. Bread is, is actually the word of God. When you start to read the word. He sent his son, which is the word. The word became flesh and he dwelled among us. So when, it, when you start to think about the word, the word is love. The word of God is amongst us. It's in us. It's written on our hearts. I said all this to say down to one thing here because I'm really going after something for 2020. And that's reconciliation. A big word. A real big word. A hard word. A word that isn't really liked in society today as far as I'm concerned. And especially when you watch the TVs. What does the TV do? Anything else but reconciliation is tear down, is destroy, is remove. So I said, well, I went back into the concordance and I looked up one of the dictionary understandings of a reconciliation. The restoration of friendship and fellowship after estrangement. In other words, you have a problem with something, something happens. Rest, you know, reconciliation is changing that back. I says, wow. In the Old Testament, 
reconciliation contains the ideas of an atonement or a covering for sin. In the New Testament, it possesses the idea to change thoroughly. To change thoroughly from one position to another. Think about that. To change positions from one position to another. Reconciliation therefore means that someone or something is completely altered and adjusted to <clears throat> a required standard. The death of Christ, the world is changed in his relationship to God. With the death of Christ, the world is changed into his relationship with God. But man is reconciled to God. But God is not said to be reconciled to man. When I heard that and read that, I said, Ah, this doesn't compute. It does not compute. The death of Christ, the world was changed in its relationship to God. It's very, very important when you're starting to go down this because I've talked about it a little bit and the Lord wants to bring this into a new place so people can really understand what's happening. Man is reconciled to God, but God is not said to be reconciled to man. By this change, uh, lost humanity is surrendered salvageable. In other words, when I got down there, that kind of made it strange. There's a little bit more went on with it, but basically it's saying the same thing back here. That was in John 3, what was it, 8 to 19. They judge, their judgment is based on this fact. The light from heaven came into the world, but they loved the darkness more than the light. Their actions were evil. That's why I can say here that men, you know, that God was not reconciled to men. There was nothing that God had to do to change to have that reconciled to man because he loved men all the way through. He's done everything for man. He's always wanted to do everything he can for you. He's tried to change this and do this and whatever he could do. But see, once he changed it, it made the fact is that if people who liked and wanted the light, see in 18, there is no judgment awaiting those who trust him, but those who do not trust him have already been judged by not believing in the only son of Christ because they don't want the light. They didn't want to come into the light. And that's what it's saying right here. And I says, wow, that's kind of interesting. Maybe that might explain it a little bit better for somebody or not. But the death of Christ, the world, is changed in its relationship to God. In other words, man is reconciled to God. The sin, was it talking about? Sin, the relationship, has been removed. It's been reconciled. It's been changed. And, you know, it was talking about the new, the possession to change thoroughly, to change thoroughly from one position to another, one position to another. This is why when it comes down and it says, uh, you know, we are a new creation, old things have passed away, all things have become new. And that's in Second Chronicles 5, 16, 17, or 17, I should say. Second Chronicles 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things became new. Wow. The reconciliation of what happened with God by sending his son and Jesus dying on the cross, washing away our sins, now changed us. And I talked about it, I think it was last Sunday, if I kind of got through that part of it. When we were talking about how Adam was had a rib taken out and cre and God created Eve and brought the female and brought him over. Both male and female were called Adam. There was no variation. There was nothing different. They were all one together. And see, that's why it says that in the spirit, he restored us. The restoration came back to us. In the spirit, we are all one. See, he's changed us by his death. He brought us back to that place. See, and it, and it says in there, no, and, uh, if a man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, all things become new. That's what has actually happened. 
we have been changed in such a way. What happened in the garden has now rechanged us through the reconciliation of the love of Christ by dying on the cross and the blood being shed, changed us into that same all being Adam. In other words, when it says that you are a new creation, you're a new creation. I don't think people have believed that. I don't think people understood that. I think they just said, oh, you know, that's good. You know, I got the love of Jesus in me, and I've got the spirit in me, and that's it. No, he changed you back to what he legally made Adam to be. Adam to be. I mean, you might have to do a little studying on that and going from there. But this is why it's so important. Because of that, reconciliation is so important. This season of love, God wants to bring reconciliation to every man and woman in this world. That's what it's about. Reconciliation. Changing people's lives back into what they were designed to do. Changing people back into knowing that I can do things, knowing that I can be loved, knowing that these things we can walk through, knowing that I can, you know, I, I can do anything because God loves me. Reconciliation, very, very important. That's what I keep hearing for 2020. Reconciliation. We sometimes work on getting people saved. We sometimes work on people getting set free. But are we really evaluating our lives on about the love is a love putting it farther than what we would normally go and do what we normally do? And are we going to re bring reconciliation, actually change those people back into what God had designed them from the very beginning? Are we going to the relationships that we've had and the people that we can't stand being around? Oops. Reconciliation. I can't say that they're going to change. But if you aren't changing to them, you got a problem. You better be checking your heart. You better be checking when you start saying something. It's like Joyce Meyer's husband, Dave, was driving. They were driving down the road, and they seen this one business uh, that he worked for one of their trucks on the road, and he made a comment about that business, and all of a sudden he realized he had a problem in his heart over that business. He had to reconciliate, had to change that around. And forgive those things that happen. Make it different. So you got to remember, make it different. Bring it back. Change it. Especially when it comes down to people that we know. When we're working with. Reconciliation, restoration of friendship and fellowship after entanglements. Woo, anybody entangled with anybody here lately? Anything going on in your lives? Anybody coming against you in your lives? Wow, I tell you what, just think about that. Are you really into reconciliation? Why are we supposed to be in re reconciliation? You wanna play that video, Sarah? We've seen this before, but it's always good to go back and look at it. Ambassador's primary objective is to take, to represent a nation from which he is sent to a nation that he is in, he's, he's sent to, to represent the nation he comes from, his nation of origin. His objective is not so much to go to this new nation and establish a comfortable lifestyle, but his primary objective is to come into that nation and represent the in interests of the nations from which he came. Does that make sense? So like I'm from Ethiopia and an Ethiopian ambassador that's in DC, uh, in that embassy, the Ethiopian embassy, which I actually happened to drive by this past week, I was doing a leadership conference up there at the Ethiopian church and we had a national convention and it was awesome. God showed up and signs and wonders and all kinds of good things happened. But I was there and we drove by the embassy and that embassy is a property less than the size of this sanctuary right here. But it's sovereign land. 
even though it's located in Washington, D.C., in the United States of America, when I step into the gates of that embassy, I'm actually stepping into Ethiopia. That's sovereign land. That's powerful. Now, within that land, if that embassy ever got attacked by any kind of hostile, you know, elements around, you know, from U.S. or anybody else, it is comparable to the government of Ethiopia being attacked. And you've seen that in the news in the past, where, where, when a U.S. embassy has been attacked, and the United States sends all that it needs to send to defend it because it is sovereign property, and it is guarded as such. It is sovereign land. So you need to know that as an ambassador, where you were the sole of your feet. Come on, somebody. You know where I'm going with this. So your domain, where God establishes you, your job, uh, your school, wherever you go, wherever you're established, in line with the purpose of God for your life, that is sovereign land. Now, you, now the key is you got to be in line with what God is telling you to do. You can't be in rebellion. But if you're in line with the will of God, that is one of the fringe benefits of being, being an ambassador. Is that you carry a mobile embassy with you wherever you go. Say amen somebody. You are an embassy. Now this is also an embassy of ambassadors. Look at your neighbor and tell him you're an ambassador. You know, that makes you a dignitary. Say amen somebody. See, that's probably all you're going to remember. No, I'll rebuke that. I'll be, you're going to receive the word and you're going to receive the engrafted word that's going to change our lives. Amen. But we're dignitaries. Now, here's another fringe benefit of being an ambassador. An ambassador lives the same economic status or, or has the right or the privilege to live in the same economical status as he would if he was back in his own homeland. So an American ambassador living in Ethiopia has the same uh, living lifestyle, what's the word I'm looking for? Standard of living, thank you. Has the same standard of living as though he was living in America. So he is not subject to the economic status of the community in which he happened to be. There's provision available to him that he is able to maintain the status of the government, the kingdom that he is representing. But that is contingent upon the fact that he is representing that kingdom. Say amen somebody. See that's why you can't disassociate yourself from the purpose of God and try to claim the benefits. Amen. You got to plug into your purpose, but along with that purpose, as you're walking that thing out, these fringe benefits are all around you. That's why Jesus said, if you seek the kingdom and it's, all, it's righteousness, all of these things will follow you. He didn't say it might happen. He didn't say you have to go through a five-step program. He didn't say you have to confess it 10,000 times. Now, I'm not against confession, but confession is to change our mind. Not to change God's mind or not to manipulate God to give us what He already gave us on the cross. We confess because we want to line ourselves up with the truth of what God has already said. But we experience those benefits as we walk in line with His divine purpose for our lives. But as an ambassador, that's your fringe benefit. That's your right. See, my wife and I don't live, we don't live large by any stretch of the imagination, but we do live large. Because, you know, we just came back from Nicaragua and Costa Rica. You know, I'm from Ethiopia, you know, and we live in the top one percentile of the world. Now, by American standards, we're probably, you know, <laughs> we're all right. <laughs> you know? And, and, you know, but here's what I do know. Everything I ever needed, ever since I came to Jesus, I've always had. I've always had. I have always been able to, you know, well, most of the time been able to pay my bills on time. You know, and the times that I didn't, God worked it out. But I have food on my belly, I have a covering over my house, I have healthy kids, a healthy wife. And I'm walking out the call of God on my life. There's nothing more important. Listen, 
you know, it's important to understand that you're called to prosper, but you need to understand your prosperity is supposed to be contingent upon your faithfulness to the purpose. The prosperity is supposed to parallel your purpose. It is not supposed to be prosperity for the sake of prospering. There is a prosperity coming. And we believe in healing, we believe in prosperity, but how many of you know how much better is it? It's good to get healed, but it's better to heal somebody. Say amen somebody. See, we got to shift our paradigm from how do I get God to get me what I need, to how do I get built up enough to go do what He wants me to do. Amen. Now, another fringe benefit, and I'm, I'm, I'm almost uh, done here, guys, so bear with me, of being an ambassador is the defense mechanism that is built in. That you have the backing of the kingdom that you represent at all times, as long as you're representing that kingdom. Now, does God punish you or if you miss the will of God or if you if you're out of whack you know let me back up there are consequences to disobedience and you step out of the will of God then it's gonna be difficult on you God doesn't stop loving us but it becomes difficult the way of the transgressor is hard is what the Bible says now it doesn't mean your access to God is broken you can come boldly anytime as a child of the king and be restored and cleansed but when you're walking in line with the will of God for your life, God defends you. You don't have to try to talk God into defending you. Listen, if an embassy overseas gets attacked, that is a United States embassy, how long do you think it takes the president to send his army down there? Not long at all. Have you seen it happen? Not long at all. In fact, it's a quick excuse to go and bomb a few folks. Well, I mean, I'm not being political about that. You know, I'm just saying, it doesn't take long for that reaction to take place. Because that is, that embassy is you. See, as a child of God who's walking out the purposes of God and the kingdom of God, you have that, the angelic host around you at all times ready to execute on your, on your behalf to defend you against enemies that you know of and against enemies you don't know of at all times. He is faithful to do that. That's your fringe benefit as an ambassador. This is good news, isn't it? Yeah. See, we live, we live on purpose because there's no better way to live. There's, the alternative is not acceptable. What's happening? Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I just want to go back to uh, Second Chronicles 5.17. Second Chronicles 5.17. Or Corinthians, sorry. I have to get that right. Okay, therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. And old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And all things are of God who has reconciled us to him by Jesus Christ and have given to us the ministry of reconciliation. I believe in 2020, if we start to look into being ambassadors, true ambassadors, which we are ambassadors, whether we want to accept it or have accepted it, the other thing is walking into reconcili or reconciliation. When we start to look at re reconciliation and getting people changed back into the place that God wants them instead of just looking at them getting them saved. You know, a lot of people get saved, but they don't stay very long. We want to get them changed, changed, removed. That's why they were saying in, in uh, Iran, they used to work with converts, try to get converts, but they said converts, when persecution, persecution came, they fl fled, gone. But when you work with a disciple, 
and you train them up and mature them, they'll stand in persecution. It's amazing because some people just want the good things of God and they don't want to do any more. We want people who will come out and do the will of the Father. Ones that will stand on what they're supposed to be doing, whether it's easy or hard. It's been hard in a lot of cases. We've been through the fire, we know. But it's still worth it. 19, to wit uh, that God was his Christ, reconciled the world unto him, not imputing their transgressions unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of, recon the word of reconciliation. If you go down to uh, the New Living Testament there on 18, Sarah, it's still Second Corinthians 5, 18. This is New Living Testament. Kind of like it a little bit better there. All this newness of life is from God, who brought us back to himself through what Christ did. And God was given us the task of reconciling, pe reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sin against them. This is a wonderful message he has given to us to tell others. We are Christ's ambassador, and God is using us to speak to you. We urge you as though Christ himself were there pleading for you. We reconcilize, you know, be reconciled, you know, concealed to God. For God made Christ, who had never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. And then I showed the ambassador meeting because as it says that we are Christ's ambassadors. Wherever you walk is the ambassador that you are an ambassador that's the kingdom of heaven. Your home is the kingdom of heaven. This church is the kingdom of heaven. And God will protect. That was amazing what he was saying about they'll send the army. Well, I know what happened last week. I kind of lost everything. It just didn't come out right. I'm looking at my papers, couldn't figure anything out. And I was praying hard because, again, I started to work. And I don't know, I think I got some medicines that I'm using right now that are causing me some problems, which we'll be checking out here shortly. But I took and I, I started out, and I was doing fine. And all, all my, my mind just went like it did the other last Sunday. So I took a break. About that time, Debbie got home with a bunch of stuff from the grocery store, so we went and put that away and went back in. Sat there for about 10, 15 minutes. My mind went blah, blah, blah. I'm thinking, what in the world is going on here? This is crazy. So then after that, I took and took another break, and yeah, we got something to eat. and Went back to it finally at last, and I was able to find one scripture that I couldn't find prior to. I mean, no matter what I did, I couldn't find it. I found it. I knew it was in there. And once I found it, then I was fine. So I just put it down. I said, okay, we'll just go from there. Then I uh, took and, and realized, but later that night, when I woke up about 4 o'clock this morning, then I got the rest of what the Lord wanted to say and do. And I was praying. I said, Lord, I need some help on this one. I said, I don't want my brain to be scattered when I'm sitting there because here lately it seems like that happens sometimes. Like there's a warfare that's coming against me and, something's connected to where when I start to get in the presence of God, my mind starts going wild. Just, I mean, it's just blah, 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 like I just can't concentrate. And I think it's uh, a war that's coming against me that I'm dealing with. But I'm only telling you this for one reason and one reason only, because I wasn't going to say anything about that. But I was walking up here, not even paying any attention, and I got about right there, and all of a sudden I've seen angels have been up against this wall across the front and all the way down. It says for an ambassador that God will send his army. He sent his army today just to protect me and keep me from having the war from destroying what he wanted to say today. Be an ambassador. Understand your legal rights. Understand what God wants to do. And in 2020, let's go out and see how we can be 
reconciliation. Let's see how we can change people's lives. We talk bad about churches. Quit talking about the churches. Start praying for them. Start praying for them. Because I heard also in all this other stuff I've been hearing and reading and listening, and it's not just things, it's the word, it's everything else that God's been dealing with me. He said, I didn't come down just to get you saved and for reconciliation for you. But I came down for you to do the same thing for your enemies. If you don't do it, who will? If you don't do it, who will? I said, wow. Reconciliation. Does anybody have anyone of friendship or somebody that you fellowship with that is no longer here, that you had an estrangement, an entanglement, a thing that happened, an anger, a frustration that went on? God might speak to you to get off your high horse and go make recon reconciliation with that person. Because the enemy might be using it so strongly to stop what God wants to do. If people come in, and it said, one other thing was, I was listening about a, a man that was, it was a vision that he's seen, and he was talking to another man that was here on earth and had a tremendously large ministry. And he had a high respect for him. And the man said, because I was so hard on people. I, from the outside, it looked like I had a smoothest running ministry. Nothing was wrong. But because I was so critical on the inside and I wanted it my way, he says there was so much chaos inside. And we didn't achieve what we needed to achieve. Sometimes we put our own desires before God's. Sometimes we have to realize that everything that looks perfect isn't always perfect. God's way is perfect. There's some real changes that have to come in the body of Christ. Just ask God to show you and teach you. He's sure showing me and teach me a lot of things. I'm, he's really, I'm, I'm standing on the Lord stronger than I have for a long time. Before I just kind of got by because I was getting by, but now I need to stand on the Lord and the Word strong to get through this process that's going on. So I praise God for each one of you. I thank you for being here. I know there's some people that are gone because of Christmas things that are up here. I hope Pat and Cheryl, I don't know if anybody's heard from them. I hope they're doing better from their sickness and disease. We pray for Linda. She's, you know, just wore out and all the things that are happening. We know that God has many people to come here and many people to get set free. We got a lot of work to do and we need people. It's not that we want we want to go out and get numbers. Numbers mean nothing. True saints of God, people who have been reconciled, you know, brought back to the Lord is what we're looking for. We want people to get set free totally and be used in every area that they are called to do. So we just give God the glory. We thank you for each and every one. I pray that you have an awesome Christmas. Just remember, Jesus will be there on your property watching over because it's the uh, you're an ambassador. Whoops. <laughs> Think about that. Jesus is coming to your house. Wow. He's there. <laughs> He's there. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Glory to God. So we just praise God. Father, we just thank you for all that you're doing. We give you glory, honor, and praise. We ask, Father, that through this season, especially those who have been hurt, they've lost people, uh, they maybe have a home that burnt down or something's going on that uh, the enemy has been working so hard to destroy them. Father, we just pray that your hand, which is your body of Christ, will be there to help each and every person that we can. And through the body of Christ, we'll help those people to be able to get through this time period and reconcile back to you, Father. And let them know they can have a better life than they've had before. And we just give you full glory, honor, and praise in all that you are doing and everything. 
In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.